Welcome to episode 16 of the Film Inventories podcast. This time I have the third Academy Award winner that I've had on the podcast. Previously I spoke to editor Paul Hirsch, who of course received an Oscar for Star Wars in 1977, or maybe it was 1978 by the time he received it. And last time out in episode 15, I spoke to Martin Munir, who won a special Scientific and Engineering Academy Award for his rapid prototyping work on Henry Selick's Coraline. If you haven't heard that episode, do take a look at that. Martin talks at great length about his work on Coraline, as well as Starship Troopers and his early days on James and the Giant Peach. So just two nights ago, I spoke to another hugely talented member of the filmmaking fraternity, Mark Mangini. Mark is an Academy Award uh, winner for the sonically incredible Mad Max Fury Road. We spoke at some length about his work, including his entry into the profession via cartoons, and specifically about some of the work he's completed with Denis Villeneuve, whose forthcoming Dune is very much on my radar. I can't wait to see it and hear it. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mark. I'll be back as usual for a bit more jabbering on at the end including an update on a short documentary I've been working on. So Mark, how how did you get involved in this industry? What was your inspiration to, to leap into this career? Well, I, I loved filmmaking as a child, and my father gave me a, an 8 millimeter movie camera film, and I made, you know, stop-motion movies and hand-drawn animation on, like, 3 by 5 index cards, which I still have. I, I need to polish them up and add some sound to them. Nonetheless, uh, film had always been a, a great love of mine along with music. I've been a guitarist all my life as well. And in 1975 or 6, I saw the Academy Awards on TV, which was a family tradition of ours. And that's when I put two and two together that I loved cinema and, oh, look, there's a career in it. And boy, that sure looks like fun, too, that Academy Awards thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it all came together. And I told my mom and dad I was dropping out of college and I was going to drive to Los Angeles and find my fortune in movies because that's what I loved. And that's exactly what I did. I, I got here to Los Angeles and floundered for many months. You know, you, you may not know this, but in the U.S., one of the the sojourns that every kid raised on the East Coast has to do is go West, go to LA. You know, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. Every Bostonian in New Yorker has to go the other direction. So I just put everything in my car and headed West and ended up in the guest house of a friend, struggled until one day the person whose guest house I was staying in asked me, how it was going. I said, terrible. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be in movies. And that was the end of that discussion. Next day, he gave me a phone number and said, call this gentleman at Hanna-Barbera Studios. Um, he wants to meet you. Not a job, but just wants to meet you. And that was the beginning. I, I went to Hanna-Barbera. They thought I was an animator. I'm, I'm a terrible <laughs> animator. And, but they said there was a training program in the sound department. And I took the training program, graduated at the top of that class, and was then offered a job in the Hanna-Barbera Sound Editorial Department. And that's, that's the beginning. Very simple. And, you know, the, may, maybe the footnote to that is, is having been and still am a musician, I had a very good ear, and I think that uh, held me in good stead for the, the critical listening I had to use as a sound editor in the, those early days. So then you worked for Hanna-Barbera for how long then? About three and a half years, and then um, then Star Wars happened, and you know Star Wars happened to a lot of people <laughs> in, in this business, not just in sound, but in visual effects and production design, and 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 producing. Everybody wanted to make space movies all of a sudden, and and it was when, you know. I, I must say at the outset, I never was. I wasn't at that time, and I still am not a highly motivated individual. And which is to say, I, I never saw this as a means to an end. 
And I've never ha- all I ever wanted to have was a good job and to enjoy it. And so um, I was comfortable at Hanna Barbera. It was a good gig. It was a union gig, and and they took care of us, and and I made a nice salary for the time. But then I saw Star Wars, and I heard sound. I I, I didn't even know what the universe of sound was. <clears throat> I was just blithely making zips and boings and putting them in Scooby Doo cartoons. <clears throat> And then I heard the work of Ben Burt, and again, yeah. the light bulb went off, and I thought, hang on a second. There's some real fun to be had in this. One can actually be creative and, and you know, be a part of the sort of the narrative. So I left Hanna-Barbera. I, I leveraged all my friendships and called everyone I knew, and I got another interview at Paramount Studios where I was put in training yet again in the dialogue department and would end up the apprentice to the dialogue editor on the first Star Trek movie, Star Trek The Motion Picture. And as fate would have it, as, as fate has always had it in my particular case, I've been a very fortunate individual, um, that person had to leave Star Trek and left the movie to me. And I was the kid. There were all the grizzled veterans in that department, uh, literally, you know, the kind you saw in movies, you know, smoking cigarettes and, you know, drinking martinis at lunchtime. These, this is what sound editors were like. And I wasn't anything like that, who probably should have gotten the call. But because I had been trained under this gentleman, God rest his soul, John Hanley, I knew where all the bodies were buried on Star Trek. So Bob Wise gave me the gig. So within three, four years, I'm working on, you know, what was then the biggest movie in Hollywood. And uh, that's where I would then meet my uh, soon-to-be business partners, Richard Anderson and Stephen Hunter Flick. Huh, amazing to, have, you know, watch that film just a few years earlier, Star Wars, and then end up working on Star Trek. Um, going back to the cartoons for a moment, I guess that laid some good groundwork for you in as much as with cartoons there's no guide track there's no rec- on-set recording for you to kind of work from so you're kind of inventing you're designing sounds um, from scratch to begin with but I guess as well you're you're sticking to conventions that have already been established by people that came before you yeah you know it's it's it that's a, a great observation um, you know and I would add a third variable which was Hanna-Barbera like most cartoon studios it's television. You don't get a lot of time or money to do Ben Burt class sound design. You're on a schedule. You have to cut 30 minutes in two days, and that's a slog in and of itself. So uh, inevitably, one must rely on a library. And Hanna-Barbera, as I'm sure you know, and anyone who loves sound knows, Hanna-Barbera has and had an iconic sound library that had been in existence for at least a decade by the time I arrived. And those tropes are well-worn and, and maybe even much loved at the same time. We love those sounds and we love to hate them because as sound designers, of course, we want to make our contribution. So um, I, I think I did my best Ben Bird impression, if you will, by trying to, whenever possible, go outside the norm, get off the track and record something fresh and new or, you know, manipulate an old sound to make it a new sound, to introduce some kind of freshness into the proceedings that most of the, the people working in the department weren't really doing. Th- that being said, I still look back on my experiences at Hanna-Barbera as a sound editor as some of the most formative and seminal uh, because I still use those skills today and they, they are these. In animation, you are forced to and encouraged to think metaphorically. That's the fundamentals, that's the foundation of sound design. Um, You see something and you find something that represents it that isn't literal, which is why when you get hit on the head, you hear birds twitter. You don't hear, you know, and and so that developed my early understanding of sound design, which was how can we think about this moment in the in the scene differently than what it is that we're actually seeing? 
I still use those skills to this day. I mean, you know, why did Treg Brown use the sound of a, of a biplane inertia starter spinning for the Tasmanian devil spinning yeah. around? Yeah, yeah. He used that very obvious, well, maybe not obvious, visual metaphor, and that sound just happened to fit it beautifully. Um, and I, I could go on about this, yeah. Uh, yeah. but it, it's that skill of finding something in what you're seeing and applying a sound that isn't that, that, that adds something to the story you're telling in a way that you, you wouldn't think. It's oblique thinking. Yeah, because I guess you're trying to defy conventions because you want to invent something new, but you can't be so out there that the audience is going to go, hang on, wait, what? You know, well, that, that's that the beauty of, of animation thinking is that because it's often metaphorical, you find substitutes for the action um, that have corollaries in the real world. So the subconscious makes these immediate associations that, that you actually can't even help. You see the Tasmanian devil spinning and you hear a spinning sound. I, you know, I remember uh, it, when the studio got really busy and we had more work than the department could handle, we'd call the union and say, you know, send some fellas over, we need help. And they'd send somebody over from what we called the live action universe because they, you know, they were like sort of the undead. They, 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 <laughs> they had no training in this metaphorical thinking and they'd show up having just cut like a Dukes of Hazard or a Magnum yeah. PI or something like that. And all they knew were car skids and gunshots and they didn't understand the aesthetic. And we'd laugh when their, their reels would hit the mixing stage because they thought literally. They, it, it, lit, it took weeks and months to break the mold of that literal thinking to get them to think laterally, not literally. That was always a good laugh for us. <laughs> I think talking about someone like Ben Burr, I think what he managed to do was create those sounds. You know, he chose a lot of organic sounds. He recorded real sounds and then he manipulated them. And I think subconsciously we probably know that there's a grounding there we're aware that he makes them otherworldly but there's a grounding in in them in the same way that George Lucas and his designers chose props you know from aircraft junk so that we see it so we we see it as an object but we, it's sort of put in a fantastical setting it gives us a grounding as as the audience and I'm sure your job in sound design does something similar you know if you start with a sound that already exists and at least there's a kind of connection to it, isn't there? Precisely. That's a very deep observation, and you're the first <laughs> to actually make it. Um, I've written a little bit about that very phenomenon. I, I want to win the, uh, the Mega Millions jackpot someday so that I can fund a psychological study because I have a pet mm. hypothesis, and that is this. Um, all, all of my work starts life usually as, as an acoustic sound, and it's grounded in this, this idea that the brain hears the cues, the oral cues within an acoustic sound. There's the way we listen, we're, we're, we're constantly analyzing the oral universe that we're surrounded by and looking for clues that say real, not real. And mm -hmm. synthesized sounds, although they can be manipulated to approximate it, don't have those oral cues, the, the pre-delays and the echoes and the IDL and LDL. And like, there's all a bunch of scientific descriptions of mm -hmm. the way the ear captures sound and analyzes it and hears it and checks a subconscious box that says real. So if design sound starts life as acoustic, you're checking those boxes that you need to check uh, so that the audience signs off suspends disbelief perhaps is the is the, is the better term because that's what all movie making is trying to do is get the audience to suspend belief such that we can just engage in the storytelling yeah it's that kind of thing you your art is invisible in a way because it's uh it's not a visual thing but also it should be invisible because the it shouldn't be distracting to the audience unless you want it to be distracting i uh -huh. guess but well, that's that's our job. Is you, you got to yeah. play both both sides. Sometimes you want sounds not to be believable. You want to disrupt that subconscious process and have the the audience one you know scratch their heads for a moment. Part of the trick. And and when you work on a movie, at what stage are you brought on? Do you get to see like versions of the script as they're shooting it, so you're already getting things in mind, or are you brought on? Uh, much later? What, what's the situation? 
Well, I'm very fortunate in my case because I work with a lot of progressive directors and filmmakers, and my um, my my participation starts as early as screenwriting, and huh. uh, starts as late as we're deeply in trouble. Please come in and help us finish this movie. So I'm just finishing Dune for Denis Villeneuve. Yeah. And we started that in pre-production, reading the script and, and advising Denis on how sound works in his film and the, some of the moves we needed to make during production, as well as starting the design process during filming and working um, collaboratively with Joe Walker, his, his film editor, as he's building the edit, long before what you'd call traditional post-production. Just last week, a director that I work with often, uh, Gavin O'Connor, uh, the accountant, uh, the way back, uh, warrior, just last week, as he has on several occasions, called me while he was writing with his partner to ask my advice on how sound might inform a scene in ways that they hadn't thought of because they had hit a particular narrative roadblock. Huh, so wow. but these these are quite rare, but these are the ways that we sound artists can be um, unusually and non-traditionally effective. The, these ideas aren't taught in film schools, if nothing else. That that you know, sound is seen as this sort of mechanical process. At the it's an assembly line after the movie's been built. It's it's a, a bath at the lab, as as Walter Murch used to say. <laughs> you know, you yeah. put film in on on one end, and out comes sound at the other, and some magical alchemy happens in between. But you know, I would say in in feature films, which is the only universe I know, it's very traditional to have something like a twenty one week post production and. Uh, three-week preparation for a temp mix and then a five or six-week preparation for final mix and then a final mix for three or four weeks. That's a very typical studio-budgeted post-production schedule that um, at least we, we see here in Los Angeles. That, that outlines something like a, a four- or five-month involvement for me, typically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess, it, yeah, I spoke to um, a storyboard artist who worked with Ridley Scott for a number of years, and he was talking to me about how his kind of art work and his, you know, his creative skill that he has is only as good as the director who's aware of the palette he has to work with. So I guess in an example like Denis Villeneuve and, and sound, somebody who's very considerate to to things like sound and many other parts of filmmaking you know he's going to use that palette to the best of his ability and bring on somebody like you um how do you then well let me comment about... on that specifically on. Yeah. because it's an important yeah. point uh, denis is smart enough to understand that creativity and the building of his film is a collaborative process that encourages breaking traditional boundaries. So whereas 10 years ago, you work on a film with hundreds of visual effects, you wait for those shots to come in. You might be lucky enough to see some conceptual art, but then the animation starts to come in. Maybe it's not lit yet, but you see crude animation and you start building sound for that based on what you see. We work in a different way. We work in a very collaborative way with Denis where we are designing sounds freeform and often those sounds inform what visual effects are wow. doing, much like happens in animation, as you first started out with. Animation starts life with sound first. We do that often with Denis because he's looking for inspiration. If, if we, if Theo Green and I, for example, build something spectacular sonically that uh, Denis responds to, he'll send that to uh, VFX and say, animate to this. This is huh. the direction I want to go in. And then the, we, we get a, a beautiful feedback loop going. Then the animators come up with an even better idea using our work maybe as a template rhythmically or, or yeah. you know, they're, they're turning um, freak sound frequencies into colors. And then they, we, we get in this feedback loop where then that inspires us to add a sweetener to the sound we've already designed. And it's a gorgeous process of, of kind of, of symbiosis 
that again, this is you know, is not taught in film schools and is not generally spoken about in in the, the in the filmmaking narrative. Yeah, I think you're right, and you know, in in film studies and and film school, there seems to be this obsession with the visual, and I think people forget how important sound is. So when you're working on something like Blade Runner twenty forty nine, there are sounds in that that. On, at first glance, you would assume a part of Hans Zimmer's music soundtrack, but it was your work and your colleague's work, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, you have you have a very keen ear. I'm, I'm, I, I love getting thrown the, the the good the great questions to talk about work that Theo and I did that is outside the norm. It, it should be known that in the first discussions we had with Denis Villeneuve and Joe who is a, one of his significant creative partners, Denise said to us two things. One, I want you to compose with sound. And two, I want to erase the borders. What he meant by borders were the borders that delineate where sound ends and music begins. Our goal in Blade Runner was to never allow the audience to have the thought that was a great music cue or that was some beautiful sound design. We simply wanted the, the movie to sound Blade Runner-ish. We endeavored uh, heroically to erase those borders so that you would never know which was which. And, and I, I think we succeeded in that. Um, it, it started life with Theo and I creating freeform again, without picture, musical design compositions. Um, freeform, musical, pad-like tonalities that maybe didn't have a melody, but you knew had a musical center somewhere, but evoked a mood of some kind. And we've, we, we built a palette, as you rightfully recognized, and we started laying in these textures against the movie and building it out. And as we did that, that was being fed to Ben Walfish and Hans. And then they began to develop score knowing, oh, Denis wants them to work there. We'll work over here, but we'll dovetail. You know, it sounds like Mark's working in D. Maybe our cue will be in D if we want to really erase the boundaries. Or maybe, maybe we have to work against that. Maybe we want some dissonance there. Nonetheless, there was this constant process of us hearing each other's work to develop this borderless, seamless uh, soundscape, if you will, that was just Blade Runner. It wasn't sound design, it wasn't music, even though it was, it was just this environment you were in. Mm. That's, a, that's a fantastic soundtrack. And I'm talking your sounds as well as the, the musical yeah. oh, but what, um, what aspect of it. Hans and, and Ben did is extraordinary work. I, I, I get... The, the kinds of goosebumps from that as I do from the Vangelis work for the first film, which I never thought anyone would ever do. Yeah, yeah. I, I traveled, pre-COVID, I traveled a lot for my job. I flew around the world working on sporting events and often with headphones on and both Vangelis's and, and Hans's uh, tracks for Blade Runner were were visited plenty of times on aeroplanes. Yeah, that's to funny just kind you of say that. Um, and... I have a playlist on my phone called Travel, and it, it is full of all of that music. Yeah. Those are my favorite pieces. It's just because it, it transports you, I think. You're no longer, well, for me, I'm no longer in a shitty seat in coach class, you know. So <laughs> <I> can... <laughs> um, didn't um, didn't D Denny give you the, the first cut without music did, he, did they do a first cut without music then was that because am i right in saying that johan johansson was working originally on the movie and then hans was brought on later correct so did you you got a version of the film without any music correct uh, on it denis wow. and joe like a, a couple of other directors i know build their films early on in the first cut uh, and the editor's cut uh phase without music because their philosophy is that if a scene works without music, it probably wants to stay that way. And if it doesn't work without music, they want to first see if sound alone can elevate it to the, the level where they, they had always envisioned the scene. And then if that doesn't work, then they know where the, the, the critical musical beats need to be. Denis used the term calling in the cavalry 
for the score, which is to say he is of a sensibility that music is often overused. It's, it's, it's a panacea uh, that's a sign of, of um, insecurity by the filmmaker. You need to have confidence in your filmmaking. There was a reason why you shot, you wrote that scene and shot it a certain way. Have some confidence in it. And so um, in that early process of first cut, he'll give us the, the movie and we'll build out sound and once he knows what works, he knows where the music has to come in. And I think that's a very intelligent way of approaching the, that process. He's a very savvy filmmaker, isn't he, Denis? You get the sense that he really knows what he wants to achieve. I've heard stories from the Roger Deakins podcast where they did a particular scene and he just did it in one shot, kind of, in you know, a long shot. And everyone was saying, are we going in for coverage? He said, no, no, we got it. And he, he was just confident that he knew that that scene would play out and it would create an uncomfortable feeling for the viewer. He's able to dial in on this, that sort of emotional level, isn't he? Some sort of primordial thing. He's brilliant that way because he's always working from that emotional uh, level first. He works similarly with us. He, he knows when something works and then he's done with it and he doesn't micromanage, which of course frees us up to be our best at, at uh, moving on to future projects. And I would add that um, when Denis comes to the mix to listen back to the work that we've been doing, you know, it's, it's very common in our business. I, I'm assuming everyone listening to your podcast knows a little bit about the filmmaking process and the post process. And in sound, you know, we, we design sounds and then we edit them to the picture we're given. And then we bring all of that to something called the mix and we combine the music and the sound effects and the dialogue, and we have a finished soundtrack, and there's this moment we call the playback, where the filmmakers sit with you, and you finally turn out the lights, and you watch it like a movie. It's, it's then their responsibility to give you their notes, respond to what they just heard, and tell us what ways they can Im improve the, the, the film, sonically speaking. It, it is very traditional to get a very long, detailed list of what the things are that need to be fixed. You know, it, at 2 minutes and 37 seconds, the spaceships are too loud. At, at 2 minutes and 45 seconds, I don't like that rumble. Um, and then you, you set about to correct those items. Sometimes you scramble off to make a new sound or edit a new sound, and the, the, the mixers at the console are readjusting volumes and panning to get it just right. And, and you, you iteratively work that process, going down the list, checking them off one by one. Denis doesn't work that way. I mean, he does, but it always starts from an emotional standpoint. His notes aren't at two minutes and 37 seconds do this. His notes are, in the scene with uh, Deckard and Kay, I don't feel enough tension. How can sound help me build more tension here? And not only is that beautifully kind of uh, coming from a storytelling standpoint, but it, it helps bring us sound people into that process with them to be part of his storytelling team. We're not just the, the, the mechanics that are pushing and pulling the levers on the, the crane, to, you know, to lift yeah, the, yeah. you know, at, at the construction site. We're being challenged to think like storytellers to use our tools to, to enable him. And that's one of the things I really love about working with him. Yeah, because sound is so important in evoking an emotional response from us in the audience. You know, you... We, we see the emotion on someone's face, but the sound could tell a different story. The, the music could tell yet another one. And I've always found that really fascinating. You know, I have to try hard not to go in to the cinema with a filmmaking mind on. I like to sort of, the um, first viewing, I like to just immerse myself and well, then maybe on the second You know, it's interesting viewing. you say that. I, there is one test, even though I have no degree and, and no formal education whatsoever, there's a test I'm going to conduct, and that is my version of... The Kuleshov effect. Do you know this experiment? Uh, it's, it was a Russian filmmaker who discovered that if you intercut, if you intercut a neutral expression on a character with another image that has an obvious emotional content, um, a baby crying or a woman screaming, the audience cannot help but create a uh, a relationship. The brain 
is compelled to find a relationship between the two images mm -hmm. and informs that initial image of the neutral face uh, with the, the subsequent image. So we know in sound that you could show a shot of a neutral face and hear a sound that informs it and have a causal effect on how the audience reacts to that character, even though they may have a, a neutral demeanor. So I'm going to do and that therefore... experiment. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember doing film studies uh, when I was at college talking about, you know, a, as you say, a blank face and then cut into a bowl of soup. And suddenly you think he's hungry because he's it, looking at this soup longingly now. That's the Kuleshov you know? effect. And, yeah, and it yeah, works in sound be, yeah. as well. Yeah. Given, given that you can kind of change a performance in a way from an actor. Have you have you ever had actors come in and want to review how the sound is working within a scene of them? It's, it could be a one word answer, no. <laughs> you know, it's, it's rarely the design work that we're doing. It's most often when I'm on the ADR stage with them, in case you don't know what ADR is, it's the process of bringing the actor, I'm saying this for your audience, <laughs> of bringing the actor back into a recording studio to re-perform uh, their lines because of a technical problem. Uh, very often, the actor wants to either comment on their performance and change it, or the actor is now seeing their performance on screen for the first time and are unhappy about the cut. You know, and it usually takes the form of, where's my close-up? Where did that go? <laughs> because they're seeing the film for the first time when brought into yeah, the recording sure, yeah. studio. Yeah. But I can't think of um, an actor who's come in and actively commented. We have actors come to the mix constantly, and the, the most common reaction is, is one of surprise and joy and glee when they hear what, what it is that we're actually adding to the film and how much we've brought it to life. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time I saw, it must have been like the making of Star Wars or something when that was first aired, when you actually heard the sounds on set and then you, you suddenly realise what a remarkable job it is that people like you do. It's, it sort of reminds me in some way when you see behind the scenes stuff shot on, on a TV camera and then you see the finished film uh, version or the digital version. Um, it's just such a leap between between the two. You know, the, you made me think of another story on Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. Uh, Leonard Nimoy, another very progressive, forward-thinking director, asked me to make the sounds of the probe. In that film, the protagonist is this flying, like, space heater. It looks, you know, it looks like a yeah, yeah, giant yeah. water heater in space. Nonetheless, it had to have a personality and a sound and a voice. Uh, and he asked me to build that early on, not only so that he could approve it, but he wanted to play it on set to elicit the appropriate facial reactions from Kirk and the crew, because there's a couple of critical scenes where they're hearing the sound of the probe on set for the first time. You know, Kirk says, uh, Uhura, uh, uh, put it on speakers or whatever, whatever he says. And <laughs> you cut to, you know, dumb reaction shots of slack jaw, Scotty and Sulu and Uhura, <laughs> and he didn't feel as though uh, that would be as successful a set of reaction shots had he not been playing the sound of what they might be hearing at the same time. So we, I, I sent those sounds over and production sound, played them on a speaker, and, and Leonard was very happy with the result. Brilliant. It wouldn't have never it would never have occurred to me that that could be used as a tool. But as we said, it's about that director understanding the kind of palette he has to work with. Um, well, you know, Leonard fantastic. was an, a brilliant director because he came from theater before he was a film director, and uh, he understood the motivations of actors, and he he knew what it what actors use to get the motivation, and he knew enough to know that sometimes that's sound. I'll, I'll give you another example: a uh, Gavin O'Connor, who I spoke of earlier builds playlists based on his screenplay and he builds them for all the scenes in the movie and he always has production sound uh, with a live speaker on set so that as they're setting up and prepping and last looks he's playing a scene appropriate music from his playlists to help get his talent and the crew in the mood for the, those moments i think that's just brilliant that's fantastic you can imagine it sort of draws everybody together like an audience would be at a concert or something they're all experiencing the same thing and getting the same 
vibe because there there is something that goes on between us that we can't see you know between our in, our, our interactions that are invisible oh that's a great idea i was going to ask you a question as well about the use of silence you know we we don't know that sound what sounds doing until it's kind of taken away but then you know i think i think it was maybe john williams said about when music is taken away it's just as important as when music is is placed on a scene and you have that same tool as well with silence what what do you think is the most powerful use of that tool well the first the recognition that it is part of your palette you know it's a strange thing uh, we in sound we've been rightly or wrongly viewed as the artisans who add something to the film and and, and we a lot of us myself included get stuck in that mindset of sound design as as an additive process but that's only a part of our process this sound design is literally telling stories with sound and we need to understand the value of subtraction and minimalism because it's it's a tool we have uh, and silence is a very powerful tool that we have that we often forget to deploy the, the interesting thing about silence or one of the many interesting things about silence is the best way to use it you know it's funny I, i've had several experiences in the past where the filmmaker wanted to use silence, we all thought it was a great idea, and we indeed removed all sound in, in, a, in an area to the point where it was literally digital zeros, meaning there was no sound coming out of speakers. And that's a mistake. Let's just, let's start by saying sound, silence is powerful, use it more, put it in your toolbox, but please don't ever go to complete silence. The reasons are manifold. One is the audience will think there's a problem with the projection or the theater, yeah. and they'll be taken immediately out of the film. You can have silence, but the way to achieve silence is having just enough quiet, either through the intelligent use of dynamics or just the faintest trickle of sound that is what the brain equates with silence in real life because we don't ever hear complete silence in real life even when we close our ears. We are immersed in sound our entire lives and can't block it out. And so part of the uh, psychological effect of silence is in fact the presence of a minimal amount of sound. But the key to making that minimal amount of sound effective as if it were a lack of complete lack of sound is to interrupt it occasionally the reason we think we've been um, immersed in silence in real life are the moments when a long time has gone by and then is interrupted by something that makes us think oh my god it's been really quiet but you don't think of that until you hear the little something you know trickles down in the corner or a, a little something skitters in the or that little creak in the roof of your house late at night mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. interruption of the silence that m- creates the silence itself and so you you have to learn to to use those moments as artists do i know nothing about art but an artist once told me that the best way to get white to look whitest and to me the the visual metaphor of silence is white sort of the the lack Mm. of all color Mm -hmm. lack of all sound is to put a speck of blue in it by to create the contrast so it's this whole idea of contrast um you know the other uh, power of silence is its ability to highlight the loudness that you want to get as i'm sure you know and maybe bemoan um, movies are getting louder and louder and louder uh, to a, to their detriment. And we keep trying to find ways to make them louder and louder, technically with you know um, new kinds of digital recording technologies and playback technologies. And the way to make, again, following this metaphor of, of contrast, the way to make loud sounds louder is to precede them with as much silence as you can. Now, to shift to a a culinary metaphor, you can't have a great meal if everything tastes salty 
and everything tastes sweet. You have to be constantly creating dynamics in the presentation of your work so that there is this contrast. You enjoy the salt more if it follows something that is sweet or vice versa. So it's our jobs to, to look at an entire film soundtrack as if it were one thing and determine have we been too loud for too long and where can we put some valleys so that we can more appreciate the peaks when we really need them? And that's a sort of meta-analysis that everyone should engage in with their filmmakers um, to do intelligently because you'll discover important areas of silence or quiet that maybe you hadn't thought of before that work like gangbusters to your advantage. Yeah, I guess, like, as, as you described there, you kind of have to earn that moment of silence. And maybe um, a silence will earn the next loud part, as you say, you know, it's it's got to be about the balance, hasn't it? I, I'm kind of fed up with this wall of sound approach that you get in some of the, the big blockbuster movies. Yeah, the best ones are, are intelligent where to build the walls and also where to build the... Um... What's the military term? The the trenches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I would add that filmmakers like Denis Villeneuve and George Miller, we will make a conscious dynamics pass. We try to divorce ourselves of the granularity of the moment. Was the music too loud? Could I hear the dialogue? Do we like that sound effect there? And just watch the movie solely with the purpose of determining are we too loud? Where are we too loud? Where did we not hear dialogue? We, we, we'll do a dynamics pass, strictly as, as a notes pass for, for loudness and softness. Mm, yeah, I can imagine that's a very important part of the process. Um, as um, somebody who's worked in the business, what is it, 40-something years? 40, seven, 1976 I started. Yeah. Do, how do you kind of strive to keep a, a freshness in your work because we spoke didn't we about that kind of wanting to defy convention but also not wanting to do something so esoteric that the the audience kind of gets up and walks out right. <laughs> so how do you find how do you find that kind of originality what what drives you because you, you said as well you're, you're not super motivated in terms of wanting to reach this amazing end point but at the same time you must be driven in what you do to be able to achieve that originality again and again? Well, there's a lot of um, facets to that. One is I'm the last in a long line of 100% Italians in my family. And I say that because there's a, there's a Geppetto in me. There's a Michelangelo in me. There's this Italian artist craftsman in me that can't help doing this because I love it. I'm, I took my dad's sage advice, which was find something you love to do every day and make a career out of it and you'll be happy the rest of your life. And that's what I've discovered. Whether I get paid for this or not, I'm going to keep doing this because this is something I want to get up every morning and do. And, and I'm attributing that partially to this sort of Italian heritage of I have to get up and I have to dig my hands or my ears into something and at the end of the day, put it on the shelf and say, I made that. I don't need the approbation of, of others because the joy is A, in the making and B, in the joy of appreciating something beautiful that I've made for its own sake, not for the recognition or anything else. All that you know, superficial uh, attributes aren't as meaningful to me. And that's why what I meant more by, uh, in my earlier statement, about being motivated. I'm highly motivated. I'm one of the ha hardest working people I know. If if I'm on a tear, if I'm in like a creative fever, my wife can't talk to me for two days. <laughs> what I meant by it is that I, I don't do this to make a lot of money and I don't want to be the world's best sound designer and, and I don't want to have that turn into being a director and have that turn into be a studio. Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't have these high aspirations. I simply want to be a Geppetto. I want to hand craft, hand tool something, make it beautiful, make it pleasing to me and put it up on a shelf and say, there it is. I hope you like it. Yeah, and I'm happy yeah. whether you do or not. 
That's nice. You're not climbing a sort of perceived ladder. You're climbing your own ladder. You're just trying to better your yourself each in each iteration. That, yeah, that's, and that, that's that, very inspiring. That, that's what motivates me is that every movie is a challenge for me, and 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 that's a goal I set for myself. Even if it's you know not every movie I do is a Dune or a or a Blade Runner or a Mad Max. I do everything under the sun and. They're not all as challenging as those films, but I always find some way to make it the new challenge to either develop a new skill or get out in the field more because one of the great joys of sound design is fresh recording and that, that, that yeah. you just can't beat being outdoors with a microphone and capturing the world and then seeing it or hearing it back up on screen. So there's, there's just tons of motivation in, in every film that I do to... To, and I also, you know, to me, I have this sort of holistic approach of always wanting to exercise all my muscles. I mean, if I, if I just did science fiction films, there's only certain muscles I would exercise and, and others would lay fallow. But then when I do a, a comedy, I get to re-exercise those muscles that I haven't used in a long time. And I, I feel like I'm constantly trying to, you know, strengthen the, the whole of myself, Sonic, yeah. you know, creatively by taking on yeah. all these crazy projects that's really inspiring because i think there is a tendency for people to think that once they get in an industry they have to kind of break through these these barriers in terms of different different roles you know completely different roles like you say like in my industry my tv industry you might start um as a runner and then you might go to the sound department or you might work in editing and then eventually you want to become a director but i've been doing the editing for 20 years now uh, some people may say I'm no better at it than when I started, but to me, I know I've got all that experience and, and I'm building upon it because I think sometimes there's something to be said about refining a craft rather than using it as a, a as a rung on a ladder. I think that's, I think that's inspiring it, stuff. Well, the thought of, of creative stasis is anathema to me. I, I feel like I'm duty-bound. I owe it to myself and my family and my peers to constantly improve. I... I, it's like continuing education. I, I, I'd feel like I'm dying if I kept using the same approaches or tools or plugins, if you will. I, I, I'd feel like I'm on a treadmill if, if that were, were life. You know, what we do in sound is, is hard work and there's long hours and it takes a lot of dedication and we don't get the recognition we deserve. So you, you, you got to find other ways to, um, I guess, nourish yourself. And that's one way. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you say you don't get the recognition. There was a moment in your Oscar acceptance speech when you won for uh, Mad Max Fury Road um, that you mentioned that George Miller had said. Do you, you remember the quote? Obviously, can you tell my listeners? What oh, that no, was? the quote was uh, George Miller said this on the last day of the mix. Uh, I, I didn't use it in my um, acceptance speech, but I, I was quoted in a number of articles because George on the last day of Mad Max before he went back to Sydney um, said to us, Mad Max is a movie we see with our ears. I think that's fantastic. I always, I remember when I was, I was at um, college and I did a film kind of um, section and I was trying to get across to my fellow students about our little short film we were making, how important sound was. They said, oh, don't worry about sound, forget about it. We've got to focus on the visuals. And I remember telling them, this is a, a time when, there were VHS bootleg copies of films kind of going around. And I said, answer me this. If the, if the vision is good and the sound is bad, you can't watch it. But if the sound is good and the vision is bad, you can watch it. And they all kind of went, wow, yeah. <laughs> I won't leave that in the podcast because I don't want to talk about pirated movies. But Well, you should. Was... It's an important topic. And I was just asked this. Um, a documentary filmmaker asked me, what advice I'd give about sound. And I said, the tell, as we say in poker, of a, an amateur film is its sound, not its image. And the reason is, if the audio is bad, the audience equates that with an amateur production. And so my advice to documentary filmmakers and low budget filmmakers and, and students is, even at the expense of sound design and post-production, Spend your money to get great production sound. You will be thankful every day 
of your filmmaking life for having spent that money that will be the wisest money you spent. Because, you know, we know what it sounds like when you put a microphone on the camera instead of getting a, a proper boom person or a, or a lav on your talent. You know, we, we know what it's like when those voices just sound too far away and not part of, of that, that, that sort of intimate cinema experience. And there's no recovering from it, though there are, you know, sophisticated post-production tools to attempt to remedy that. It's one of the few things you can't undo in sound is remove all that awful roominess and reverb from a badly recorded track or all that static if, if there's some kind of interference on your, on your radio channels. Um, there's just things that you can't undo to make something sound really great anymore. Yeah, we have that same issue in, in the, I mean, live TV, as I said, and, you know, they might throw to a, a sports person who's just um, been interviewed moments ago and we're kind of turning it around as live. And if the wrong mic was selected at the time, it's not like we're going to use it, but it sounds crap. It's like we cannot use it. And that's, you've, you've missed that moment, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's good advice. It's good advice. I, um, I used to record films off the TV with a cassette recorder that my granddad gave me. Um, just a little kind of cassette recorder with a handle on it. I could walk around with it. So I used to record sounds a lot when I was younger. And a lot of those early films, I'm, I'm what, I'm 45 this year. So a lot of those early films that I recorded off TV in the late 70s, early 80s, when we didn't have a VHS recorder, I knew them through sound. And <laughs> you I think, just recorded the audio. Just recorded the audio. We didn't have a VCR. I just had cassette and audio. And I, if it was too late, I'd leave my dad with the job to kind of flip the cassette over you know, maybe in an ad break or something. Sometimes I, I knew, I knew like Star Wars for for many years, but with a whole ten minutes missing because my dad forgot to turn the tape over. You know? <laughs> but the point I wanted to make was that I think it's a fantastic introduction into the, the the movie making process because even at that age, I was kind of aware that there's a kind of poetry and a rhythm to sound, and especially in that film in particular, in Star Wars, that kind of final battle scene where there's all the chatter over the radio. It's almost like music. It's it's a it's a it's a musical. Oh, there's composition. absolutely rhythm, and timbre, and, and intelligent decision making. I've been proselytizing for for years that <laughs> what what we do in sound design is no different than what the composer does with the score. If you're if you're good at what you do, you're applying all the same sensibilities that John Williams or Hans Zimmer might apply. You you are concerned with rhythm, timbre, tempo. Uh, coloration, instrumentation, orchestration, timing, um, dynamics. You know, I, I could go on. This is the yeah. language of uh, music composition. It's the exact same language of sound design. We have to be concerned with all of those elements for something to feel organic and really useful. And the great sound designers consciously or unconsciously leverage all of those skills in building, in building a movie soundtrack. Is it quite typical that people that do what you do, sound designer, sound supervisor, sound editor, that they are musical people as well? Well, I would say um, th there's no either or, but there is a preponderance of uh, musicians who are also really accomplished sound designers. Uh, you know, we don't learn sound design as six-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds but we took guitar lessons and piano lessons and violin lessons yeah, as yeah, six, seven, eight yeah. year olds. So we developed those aesthetics much earlier because it's so much more socially acceptable and there's, there's an infrastructure for that. There's no infrastructure for learning sound design at eight years old <laughs> that your mom and dad want to shove you into after school. <laughs> I wish there were. But yeah. um, so for that reason, those, 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 those skills develop much earlier. We just... Again, not a skill taught in any of the film schools. Mm, mm, yeah, it sh absolutely should be. I was thinking as well about how, you know, a composer would compose music for a character to kind of get a certain message across about that character and where they are currently and where they're coming from and where they're going. Do you pick a kind of sound palette for characters um, in that regard, in that, in that, in a similar way that a composer would, would you select particular sounds that yeah. wouldn't be used elsewhere? Yeah. Well, uh, palette building is such an essential part of sound design, as it, as it is with film scores. A composer determines that they want a certain feel to their music, and they choose. 
this will be orchestral or this will be non-orchestral or you know and i'm going to use these kinds of instruments so too do we do that in sound design i did the two flintstones movies do you know the cartoon characters the flintstones yeah so yeah. you know it was made very movies, clear yeah. to me that um it's the stone age so my palette was limited to rock and wood. I couldn't use metal <laughs> or plastic. So sure, right there, yeah. there was a self-limiting palette uh, for a anything that I would design for the movie, and, and including you know mechanized sounds and things like that. But we can go a little more granular. Um, you know, uh, Foley is always a great place to explore um, character development with sound. And we, you know, going back to that Kuleshov effect, you know, you, you could be on a, a medium shot or a close shot of a character and, well, you wouldn't even have to do that. There's a couple ways to do it. Imagine a character walked into a room and you don't know much about them, but their shoes creaked and they had on some leather shoes. Well, mm. in Foley, we would augment that because generally speaking, subconsciously, we equate the sound of a, a squeaky leather shoe with some level of um, poverty. That this person can't afford new shoes, uh, so they're wearing the ones they've had for 15 years because they creak, because wealthy people, by the way, don't wear creaky shoes. You know, <laughs> a, a, another way yeah. to, to speak to a person's a station in life or, or psychological state is you're on that medium shot and you hear some keys jingling in the pocket. Now, you don't know this character yet, but we subconsciously equate key jingling with nervousness. People yeah. don't jingle the keys in their pockets when, they, when they're feeling confident and calm. So, you know, we can leverage little, little sound beats like that to speak about characters that, that are far more effective shorthand than the exposition it would take in voiceover or for this character yep. to say those things to the audience. Yeah. In, in working on Blade Runner 2049 being a sequel, did you, did you use any of the sounds that were from the original movie? I mean, obviously you would have gone there to kind of look for inspiration for any new sounds, I'm sure. No. But was that a whole new soundscape? Completely, not a, not a single sound from the original Blade Runner in the new film, but a great deal of inspiration. In fact, uh, Theo and I did a great deal of research on the film so that we could immerse ourselves in that sound and try to understand what, what gave the first Blade Runner its sound so that we could use that as as a guiding principle without using any of the sounds themselves. So we studied it for weeks and it had the good fortune of, in fact, getting the original soundtrack from the studio and hearing the separations. We could hear just what Vangelis was doing, just what the sound design was doing, just what the dialogue was doing in isolation so we could pick it apart in great detail so that we could do something very original without ever copying the sounds, but copying what it did successfully in immersing the audience in, in a new universe. Um, we developed a term on our film that I don't, we're not taking credit for, but it is being, I'm, I'm hearing bandied about more and more uh, recently, which is called world building. That's, that's a big part of what sound designers do is world building. We want to create a kind of logical, coherent soundscape that feels like it's all of a piece. Every sound you hear makes sense for the universe that we're trying to immerse you in the middle of and no sound takes you out of that experience mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. isn't part of, of a unified idea of the soundscape we're trying to create. Yeah, there's a real trick to that, isn't there? Gaining that verisimilitude where you, it feels part of the world you're in, doesn't take you out of it. I mean, I'm always amazed at those things that you guys do where, you know, we've all heard the stories like we've said about Ben Burt where the TIE fighters were what an elephant trumpeting and a right. car driving along a wet road right. and in in raiders which you also worked on and we we've, we've spoken about before um the punch sound is like some leather, wet leather jackets being hit or something like that do you walk around with a microphone do you have one in your bag you know like a journalist would have a notepad or an artist might have some pencils and a piece of paper just sort of thinking you know what that would fit really well with this or you know because you have to make a leap of imagination to think that 
an elephant and a car could make a sound of a spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of that non-linear thinking that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. But yes, the direct answer is yes. I have, as a journalist, always has a, a notepad with them. I always have a recorder of some fashion with me at all times. I have a little $100 one that I keep with me at all times in my pack. So I, I, am, I am never a moment in life without a sound recording device. Um, I'm here at home right now, and I have no fewer than four digital recorders, three of which are available to, to hit record on it at a moment's notice, and another that I could uh, throw in the trunk of the car and head out to do something with. And that gives me the, the option of, of capturing something spontaneous in the world that, that I didn't expect to happen, but I might not ever get another opportunity to have happen. And you, you don't want to miss those opportunities. And that's how we build our libraries and we build our sonic aesthetic by, by hearing the world in terms of how it might actually sound in, in a movie should we have the opportunity to use it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for those sounds. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of some fun anecdotes about how we, well, how I, we did that. I, I remember hearing you talk about the sound for the, the car, the spinner in, in, in Blade Runner. I mean, that was derived from a sound that you would never connect necessarily with a, with a, a, a spaceship or a car or any, any form of transport, really. Well, you know, that starts with a philosophy and a design aesthetic. Um, one, as we talked about, it needed to be acoustic. Um, and two, part of our design aesthetic was that it should not start life as something that might speak to a moving vehicle in the first place. So Theo and I didn't want to record jets or rockets or vehicles as, as the source inspirations for the sound. And we went to a very, very uh, useful and common target of sound designers for, for ships, and that is musical instruments. And so the uh, spinner started life as a bull roarer, which is an indigenous instrument that can be a number of plant items. I, I usually do it with cat and nine tails that you can spin above your head. It doesn't have to be a cat and nine tail, but you can also have them made. You can put an object on the end of a tether and spin it around and you get this lovely vroom, vroom, vroom. The vibration sound to us felt like an engine sound and the spinning sounded like the rotation of, a, of an engine or a cylinder or, or something, something reciprocating that implied propulsion. So the sounds of the spinner started life as these spinning musical instruments, and then we brought them into Pro Tools and manipulated them to then deliver all the specific things that something that moves has to do. It has to start and accelerate. It has to start close and go away into the distance. It has to pass by the audience. So you have to take all these sounds of a thing that doesn't do that and then imbue them with those characteristics electronically in the sort of manipulation phase of design so that they can then fit to the imagery that we have. You have a cool job. <laughs> well, it's just play, but it's, it's sandbox stuff. For me, it's, it's playing. I do, again, I, I would do this, you know, like musicians, it, you surely know many musicians and composers, their lives started as, as pianists or guitarists or violinists, and they became composers. But just because they became composers doesn't mean they stopped playing guitar or piano or violin. If they weren't composing a score, they still would be playing those musical instruments. And so that's what I, I still play with sounds even when I'm not working on a film. And that, that, there's a good one. If we don't get to this topic, I'm going to bring it up now. I, I get asked a lot by film students, what advice would you give to somebody just starting out? Among the many things I recommend, one is do this every day, whether you're getting paid for it or not. The secret to success in anything, not just sound design, is do. Do in quote, the word do in quotation marks. Do, 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 do. 
do every day because this is what you love and what you believe in. And in that process, you will develop the, these incredible creative and mechanical muscles that you will use and leverage through your entire career. You learn by doing and you learn by making mistakes and by making mistakes, you learn again. As the Buddhists say, um, when you lose, you don't lose the lesson. Mistakes are an essential part of the process, and you can't make mistakes if you're just waiting for somebody to pay you to do. You have to do it on your own. You have to get out and record when nothing's going on. You have, like I did on Blade Runner, I was out, I had the good fortune on Blade Runner 2049 of a movie that took place in the rain and Los Angeles having once in a century epic biblical rains. And I was out at three in the morning in the pouring rain with no protection, capturing you know authentic surround sound rain textures to put in the movie because I wanted the movie. Nobody was paying me overtime at three in the morning to capture these sounds, but I wanted them because it was my movie. I took authorship of it. So there's my preach. Nice. Sorry to get on nice. my soapbox there. <laughs> no, that's great. I did just have a couple more questions, if that's okay with sure. you. Sure. Um, there was a question that uh, one of my Twitter followers, somebody called That Sledge 1981, his name's Martin, I believe. He said, in inner space, there are loads of Looney Tunes sounds. Was that Joe Dante or was that Mark uh, speaking to Mark's background in cartoons? Um, boy, great observation. It is a combination of the two. One of the, the joys of my par long partnership with Joe Dante, one of my favorite directors and good friends, is a mutual love of the Looney Tunes shorts. Not, not knowing that when we first came together on Gremlins, um, that discovery became the excuse to use them whether they were, they were right or good or not. We were, those were gonna be our Easter eggs and our, our pay-in to uh, Treg Brown, the great sound designer for the Looney Tunes shorts and uh, Chuck Jones as well. And that aesthetic, uh, that, that aesthetic was our aesthetic. And it also gave me the opportunity to live a lifelong goal of going into the archives at Warner Brothers and finding the masters to these sounds. I mean, I had admired and praised those sounds for my years at Hanna-Barbera. I aspired to be that successful and develop as iconic a library as Treg did for the Looney Tunes shorts. But I didn't know where they, I only heard them in the cartoons. I didn't know where they lived. I, I couldn't get my hands on the Tasmanian Devil spinning, or the Roadrunner blip, or you know, you name a hundred sounds. Um, and when I got on Gremlins, my first Warner Brothers project, I had permission to go into the archives and dig deep and look at the card catalog and look at the handwriting by Treg himself and Dick Glazier, who cataloged them, and where it talked about how they made these sounds and what cartoon they used them on for the first time. And I was in just hog heaven. And when I told Joe about this, he, we would have listening parties and he'd come to my sound design room and we would just, you know, like two teenagers in the 50s who would play, like, you know, play uh, Little Richard or Fats Domino. Joe and I would play stupid cartoon sounds from the Looney Tunes shorts. <laughs> and once we, you know, and that sort of cemented our bond and we started looking for the, the silly places to put the sounds in the, in the movie in the first place. And it, it also, of course, gave the movie a little bit of levity that it needed and already had. It, it can be a pretty shocking film in the amount of gore that they do show. And we, we wanted to counterbalance that as much as we could with some fun. Yeah, great, great answer to a great question there. I'm, I'm glad that um, we had time to answer that one. Yeah, so with, a, with, a, with an editor on a movie, do you have much collaboration with them? Because I always think of like an example where, I think it was for E.T., um, the, the chase scene on the BMXs was already cut and then John Williams composed the music and he said, look, if you made this snip here and this snip there, this music's going to fit that nicer and they changed the edit to accommodate the the music have you had a situation where your work has had that influence on the editor it happens on every denis villeneuve film and with several other directors as well um, these collaborative directors yeah who understand, I, you know as yeah. i was mentioning earlier starting on blade runner 2049 denis we always start sound 
when production, when filming starts, and we are constantly feeding Joe Walker our sound designs as he's building the edit. So sometimes the edit is taking shape because of the sound. He's using the sound to help inform where he makes his edits even before we have a chance to see the edit and ring him back and say, could you make a nip here, nip there? Because it would be better for sound. We're in effect on occasion preempting that process by leading it for he and Denis. And inversely, he'll get a cut done, he'll hand it over to sound, we'll build sound for it, and either make those recommendations or send it off with sound and Joe will see how sound works and take the initiative to change it because of the way sound is working or not working. He will expand or contract a cut. So um, this is not uncommon I remember I I did a very funny comedy called Cool Runnings about the Jamaican bobsled team. And that editor was also a very collaborative editor. And he handed over the big sequence where they they do the trial run to get into the Olympics. And it's no music. It's, It's all an action sequence with no dialogue. And it's incredible shots of, you know, bobsleds, you know, zipping by the camera in two frames. And we wanted that to be kinetic and dramatic. And he had cut it in such a way that he would allow the bobsled in a dramatic close-up to fly by the camera and he'd leave four or five or six frames on the tail of that shot where the bobsled had already gone by and then cut to the next shot. Maybe it's an onboard of them bouncing around. And having had experience with chase uh, sequences in the past, I asked him if he could trim that up because I said you get better kinesthesis, if that's the right word, if you trim off that dead air at the end of the shot and allow the sound to carry you into the next shot and we will pan that sound into the surrounds and carry it over and that's a glue that binds these scenes and makes them feel more exciting. And he did just that, and the, the results were, were tremendous. Uh, they, they, the, the director just loved the sequence even more, and we ended up playing it for Don Steele, who was the president of Disney Studios at that time, and all a big success because of it. So that, that can be an extremely valuable process. And, and on Dune, we've been doing that for 18 months feeding sound back to editorial, which then feeds it back to VFX. Then VFX reacts to the sound, redoes the VFX, it comes back into editorial, editorial sends to us, and the loop perpetuates. I'm sure one of my colleagues who I know listens to my podcast, Martin Cooper, or Coops as we call him, he's a sound uh, engineer, sound guy in, in the sport that I work in, mostly Formula One, motor racing. So I'm sure he's listening very keenly there to your your take on you know, creating sound for fast moving objects. So that's great. <laughs> oh, that's, that's one of the most fun things to do is making fast moving objects. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, I'll give you one little nugget for the audience because I can't speak about Dune, but if you know no. Dune, you know that in the Dune universe, we have worms. Uh, so that's no, um, that's not a giveaway and I don't violate <laughs> my NDA. And in fact, the look of the worm started with the sound of the worm. It's one of oh, the wow. it's it's one of the first things that Theo and I started on, and struck out a number of times with early designs. Though they made their way into the edit, the edit never made its way to VFX because Denis and and Joe and I and Theo were still working on the sound until one day, a sound that in fact Dave Whitehead had made. Dave Whitehead is a very famous sound designer in his own right, but he worked with us on this film. I, he had sent me saying something like, Mark, here's a sound. It's kind of crazy. Not sure it really works. Tell me what you think. And at the end of a, a sound brief with Denis, where I had exhausted the, the mock-ups that Theo and I had made and not and kind of striking out, I said, you know, I got this one more thing. I don't think it really works. Dave doesn't really think it works, but... I'll just maybe, you know, I'll, I'll play it for you and you can then, then we know what direction to go in. And I played it for Denis and the room was silent and he said, as he is known to say, Mark, I deeply love this. And that, <laughs> and that sound did not change one iota for a year. And then that went to VFX and they animated to that sound. 
Perfect. That's amazing. That's fantastic. <laughs> it must be so rewarding to work with somebody like Denis, who, you know, has really got your back and and puts trust in you because that's what it comes down to. Ultimately, he's trusting the craftspeople around him. The joy of that is not only does he trust us. I, I, I remember like it was yesterday, my first day on Blade Runner. I had just seen the cut for the first time and I gave him my thoughts on the cut and, you know, for better or for worse, I told him the things I liked and I told him the things I didn't like. And he, he pulled me aside as I walked away. I thought we were done. He said, please continue to give me that feedback. And hmm. I, I, I want your honesty. And he's been that way with us since then. And he's beautiful when he recognizes that, that what we do is, is, a, is a mystical process. This creativity thing is mystical. None of us really understand how it works and when it's going to work. You know, I strike out as much as I hit a home run. And when I hit a home run, you get the approbation. And when you strike out, he will always say, thank you. I don't think that works for this scene. I'd like you to go in this this direction, but thank you for the effort. I see why you did this, but let's try something else. So you're always getting positive feedback for, for taking the risk. So you always feel emboldened to take risk. And that's really hard. You know, there's, unfortunately, that's not the experience for most in our business. You usually have directors who don't know how to talk to other creatives correctly. And you, what you usually get is criticism. You know, it comes in the form, in a sound brief, the director will say, well, no, that's not very good, or no, that doesn't work. Well, that's not inspiring. That doesn't encourage someone to do their, their best work the next time around. That's one of the, 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 the joys of, of people like Denis Villeneuve and, and others. Yeah. Well, I'm really looking forward to Dune, and I do hope we get to see it in a cinema, in a theater, as opposed to uh, a streaming platform, because as much as I've, you know, improved the sound of my TV, I've only got a 2.1 system here. <laughs> I want to see it as it was meant to be seen and, and hear it as it's meant to be heard. So, um, well, as you said, you know, Denis wants and needs that kind of that feedback from you. We we want as fans, we want and we need people like you in the industry. So thank you for your work. Mark. Thank you. It's very kind. It's an amazing, amazing list of films you've worked on. In fact, if I was to list my top 20 movies, you know, growing up, from, from being a kid to now, it would include most of the movies that you've worked on. So, um, <laughs> oh, that's very and I kind. Really appre- Thank I really you. appreciate your time today, Mark. Of course. It's been, uh, been fantastic to talk to you. Pleasure. And thanks for doing your research. You're, you're a tremendous um, interviewer. You, you, oh, you, thanks. You, you ask great, rich questions that allow me to say things I'm passionate about. You know, you've got to jump out of your sort of comfort zone and try new things. And that's what I'm doing with this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a relatively shy person. So this is <laughs> something new for me. And uh, yeah, I feel like I'm learning. And, and yeah, thanks for your for your input today. And, you know, you've, you've inspired me to carry on. So great. Well, great. Best of luck. I'm sure you'll do well. you enjoyed my chat there with Mark he's such a generous guy not only with his time but also just being able to impart his knowledge his experience his wisdom and do it so eloquently as well thank you Mark I really do appreciate it I've added details of his website to the show notes Um, it includes a great blog that's definitely worth checking out he's a great writer as well and some wonderful um, behind the scenes pictures which were great seeing him in his early days working on the cartoons for Hanna-Barbera and all the way up to his more recent work as well. Also, I've added his Twitter and Facebook details. Plus, there's a video I found by Soundworks Collection on Vimeo, which gives a bit more detail on the the sound department's work on Blade Runner 2049. It was really interesting to watch that after having spoken to Mark. Oh, and I've also added a page explaining the Kuleshov experiment that Mark mentioned. I did indeed learn that at university. I'd forgotten the name. For some reason, I thought it was Eisenstein, but of course that was montage editing. Thanks for joining me for episode 16. Next time, I hope to have the amazing Nilo Rodis Jamiro. If you don't know who that is, you should look him up. So take care, stay safe, be kind, stay in touch, and I hope you can join me for the next Filmumentaries podcast. Mm-hmm.